Welcome everyone to the fifth workshop in our residential solar cohorts workshop series focusing on developing inclusive solarized campaigns. Today we're going to be focusing on the campaign website, so developing and managing that site. As a reminder of where we are in this process, we are, today's the fifth workshop. Previously, we focused on having the right community partnerships, financial partners and solutions, setting goals and issuing the RFP. And today we're really gonna be focusing on the face of the campaign, the campaign website, which will be especially important during COVID due to a switch to most, mostly online presence and online workshops. Um, and this can really act as an educational resource as well. So even if you're working with organizations like Solar United Neighbors, and solar crowdsource that will be doing a lot of the development and management of the website. Hopefully this workshop will still be helpful in making sure that the branding and content still speaks to your specific community and that the sign up form is asking the right questions and such. And this will be tied closely to our next workshop on communications and outreach. So we have three desired outcomes today for participants. The first is to understand typical campaign website content and then begin drafting your own content for your own website. Second, uh, specifically on the signup form, so tailoring the campaign signup form to efficiently manage participants and track, um, track metrics as well. And third, determine campaign website roles and responsibilities. So these three desired outcomes is how we've shaped the agenda for today. So first, as in the past, we'll have a, a quick introduction and, and check-in question. And then the main content that we will be presenting and discussing is on those three outcomes. So the website content, the sign-up form, and roles and responsibilities. And about half of the 45 minutes will be set aside for discussion and Q&A. But we do have a good amount of time set aside today for the individual community breakouts to work on the worksheet for this specific workshop so that a lot of that homework you can hopefully get done during this workshop today. And then lastly, as we've done in the past, a quick report out from that exercise and I'll note the next steps for the cohort. So for today's workshop, we're going to begin discussing content and uh, developing Solarize campaign website. I'll, I'll note that many of you are working with a technical partner like Sun or Solar Crowdsource who is designing and managing the website for you. So this workshop content is generally geared more towards cities that are building their own websites. However, I'm gonna start with uh, some high level observations that are relevant to all cohort participants. And I'll try to highlight where these points are relevant as I move through the content. Um, and just, you know, as a heads up, there's a lot of, there are a lot of places where even if you are, you do have a technical partner who is working with you, it's probably good to pay attention to the content that you're putting on the website. So the first of those high level observations is probably somewhat obvious and Ryan mentioned it that, um, which is that during COVID-19, having a strong web presence is critical to campaigns. The website is really the one-stop shop for spreading information about the campaign, providing you know, essential campaign details. And so it's pretty important to, you know, to pay attention and uh, prepare a, a solid web page. The next is that since education is really such a big um, important component of Solarize campaigns, really think to utilize the website as an educational tool. You know, through the website, you'll want to be explaining how residents, you know, how, how residential solar works, how the Solarize model works, uh, what it means to participate. And then you'll want to do that in a way that speaks to the audience that you're trying to reach, provides enough detail, but isn't too technical or wonky. For, for city and community organizations um, and members on the call, thinking about how to align the website with other organizational branding or communication practices um, is pretty important here. And in a related note, you know, for folks, um, for all of you, but even folks that do have technical partners, it's really people in the cities and um, community orgs that really know your community best. So think about what speaks to your community um, and how, how you can present that on the website. 
And then another thing to keep in mind as we're, we're thinking about developing website content is that there are other related programs that you're running. So what are those programs and how, you know, what other, would some participants in other programs be interested in this and vice versa? So think about how you'll advertise and cross advertise the website, how it lines with the messaging of similar programs and, you know, how are you gonna direct folks to your website, um, you know, from those programs. And then on a related note, um, you'll want to have some sort of easy URL or a vanity URL, even if you're a, if it's a page on your existing site, so that it's easy to point um, residents to your website from your your other communications. So in this presentation, I'll be giving you an overview of the written content for typical Solarize websites, and then you'll need to work with your your web person to actually build out the page. But I do want to flag that. We've also written out sample content that you can customize for your web page. So as was the case with the RFP, we've completed a chunk of that work for you. And you can find that content on our cohort website and in today's worksheet. And since we're talking about websites here, I'm gonna begin with an overview of the content that a typical campaign website has. And then I'll walk through some live websites so that we can actually see how everything fits together and looks in practice. Um, yeah, and with that, let's, let's start going through the actual web content. So as I mentioned earlier, the purpose of the campaign webpage is to provide all the essential campaign information. So in our campaign, uh, in our sample content, we've split this up into the following sections. So there's the program details, and that includes things like how, how the campaign works, reasons to go solar, the LMI specific solar offerings and information about the partner, partner organizations. Another key part of the website is you want a sign up section or page. This is very important to show prominently because this is how participants are gonna sign up in the program. You also want the website to show events and updates. And then you know also maybe a frequently asked questions to field common queries and um, contact information for more for detailed detailed requests. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about each of these sections, and then we can see how they fit together. So most websites start with a description of Solarize, you know, something like a how it works, where you explain you know, how the campaign works, um, and a number of websites use either a timeline or um, as this, this is a screenshot from another website, just graphical steps. Um, so participants really know what they need to, um, what, what the campaign looks like on their end. This part of the website is you know, educational. So we're trying to strike the balance between including enough details, but not getting too complicated. Another common section, um, and, and I guess I should mention that these pictures are screenshots from from um, typical Solarize website. So another common section is something like a why go solar or why join the Solarize or solar co-op section. Um, so these are some screenshots from a Solar United Neighbors website and from the Solarize Philly website. Um, and you'll see that these screenshots show the website's kind of explaining some, um, some simple points for why you'd wanna go solar and they use you know bullets or bolded, um, bolded points to just uh, kind of convey the basic, um, the basic pros of going solar. Um, you know, so including reasons such as you, know, you can save money, clean energy, local jobs, and then really, um, really also talking about the additional discount, the simplified process, the financing, and the community aspect of this program makes a lot of sense here. But of course, you'd want to tailor this section to your community and goals. And since making solar accessible to LMI participants is a common goal, you want to feature any LMI specific programs and offerings prominently on the page. So in this case, Solarize Philly has a separate page for their solar savings grant program. And then um, finally, having some sort of description or section explaining who's running the program is really helpful. And this could be either a separate page and more text, or it could be 
as simple as a set of logos on the side of the main page, which is what Solar United Neighbors does. In fact, they also have a kind of neat but simple way of making the campaign personal by literally putting a face to the campaign. So you have a description of the, the project coordinator with their contact information, which is kind of a nice personal way to get introduced to the campaign. Um, and then note, you know, just these kind of sections that I've just described that explain the campaign, there are different ways of combining them. Uh, so there's of course a lot of room for creativity here. Um, so, so we've talked about, you know, sections of the web page that describe the campaign, but another important function is getting signups. So you want a signup page or embedded form, which is really easy to access. I'll talk more about the signup form in a bit since there are decision, some decisions that uh, different campaigns want to think about. But here, this is a screenshot from a Solar United Neighbors website where this is kind of what you see as soon as you land on the website and there's a prominent join the co-op button which takes you to a sign up form. So a couple of other main sections or parts on the website, you'll want to advertise events and post updates. And again, this could be a separate page, but there's a few different ways to do it. So here we've shown a screenshot of the solar crowdsource website where they have a calendar widget, um, an example of what the events look like on a Solar United Neighbors website. Um, and then there's also different ways to track updates and progress. So there's uh, on the right side of the, the screen, you'll see different, you know, the different kind of updating graphics that show the number of signups. Um, and another example of that is Solar Eyes Philly's website, where they have this kind of update widget um, that tracks the number of households that have signed up, the contracts signed, and the number of jobs created. And then last, um, you will probably want to frequently ask questions page or section to field common questions and refer participants to some contact person for more detailed queries. Um, so here we've shown a screenshot of Solar United Neighbors uh, FAQ page, which is a very comprehensive resource. So you're very unlikely to emulate this amount of detail, but you know it's a good reference to, to read through or link to. Um, of course, your website could just be as simple as having like five or six common questions and basic answers and then contact information for more detailed inquiries. So that, um, that covers the basic sections you want on your campaign um, web page. And I'm actually going to stop sharing for a moment now and switch to a different window so we can walk through some live websites and see how they fit together. So here you should see um, a browser, and this is Solarize Philly's website. Um, and so Solarize Philly, their campaign's closed, but they've got this really nice visual website. Um, you know, as soon as you land on the page, um, they have this brief overview of the campaign. So a couple of paragraphs of text, pictures, a prominent sign up button. And you scroll down, there's that update widget that, that I mentioned earlier. If you scroll down a little further, they have their sign up form right there. So participants can like very easily start filling out the form. But if I go back up to the top, you'll see their site structured um, so that they have multiple pages and they have a lot of the sections that I described. So for example, a how it works page, where if we go to this page, you can kind of scroll down and see a visual timeline of what the campaign looks like for, for participants. Um, once you sign up, how, when do you expect to hear back? How long does it take for the installation to happen? So on. So that's a really nice way of doing it. A um, couple of other things to highlight, they have a solar savings grant program for LMI customers. So they featured that prominently and explained the eligibility requirements and what that might involve. Um, and you can see on the top that they have a lot of other sections that I described in pa different pages. So they have a Why Go Solar with us, um, an FAQ, they have a news and events, which I'll go to. Um, and obviously the campaign's not running right now, but I imagine when it is, this is this page is much more populated with more events. I'm going to show you one more example of a different style of web page, which is a Solar United Neighbors 
uh, website. So this is what I want um, many of the Solar United Neighbors Solar Co-op web websites look like. Uh, when you, their, their websites are structured a little differently so that most of the information is on one page, though they do have separate pages for updates and events and information about the installers. But you know, as soon as you land on the page, there's a brief description of you know, the area for the co-op, a, a join the co-op button. And if you go down, you have um, kind of an explanation of what's a solar co-op, why would you want to join one, and then um, a description of you know, Laura, who's actually working with Miami uh, Day in Miami Beach. Um, if you go down, you can see their partners, a video for how the solar co-op works, videos of their information sessions, also in Spanish, which is great, and some information on solar economics as well. So that's another way to do it is mostly just have basically everything uh, on a single page. So that really covers an overview of the website and content. And again, for teams that are building their own web pages, we provide sample content that you can easily customize, but you will need to work with a web person to design the site. I want to focus specifically, though, on the campaign sign up and enrollment form. And that's because there's a few different types of data to ask for and questions that will be somewhat specific to your campaign needs. So I'll do an overview here of the types of questions you typically ask for in the sign up form. And then later, after Ryan presents, we'll have some insights from our guest experts. We'll specifically focus uh, on some of the data collection needs and enrollment process for LMI customers. And then again, our website content template contains all of these questions that I'm going to go over for you to adapt and customize. So residents enroll in the program by filling out a form on the website. And this is where you start the pre-screening process, connecting them with the installers. You know, you connect them with maybe other information and financing opportunities. So when participants click the sign up button or start filling out the form on your website, the data you want from them kind of falls under these general categories. So when participants sign up, you first want to start with the basics, their name, contact information, you know, phone number, email. The next step is really understanding their suitability for the program. So getting their address, home ownership status, and questions about their house condition and solar readiness really makes sense here. We've touched upon this in the previous RFP workshop, but pre-screening applicants really offers a lot of value to the installers and helps them set better prices. Um, and then I also look forward to hearing some more insight on the pre-screening process and assessing solar readiness questions for LMI customers from our experts. The next thing, the next thing you want in your signup form is you want to make the, you know, make the details of the LMI offerings, if you have any, and the eligibility clear on the signup form, and then ask participants if they think they qualify, so you can follow up. And then you also want to inquire about whether residents are interested in financing or third party options if the campaign offers them. And that's what I would say is maybe the most essential um, the, the essential parts of the sign up form, but then there's a lot of information that really helps too. So the next is electricity bill information. If you, you know, I can ask customers to upload their bill if they have it to understand the average spending and consumption that lets installers offer them the most cost effective array size. Another question you can ask here is which utility um, there is their electricity provider if the city has multiple utilities. And if you're still seeking input on selecting the installer or want information for the next round, you know, feel free to use the form to just ask residents about what they value most from a solar installer. So that could be you know, cost, um, equipment, warranty, hiring practices, and a multiple choice um, question probably makes sense here. If your campaign has additional offerings, energy efficiency, storage, EV chargers, that's, um, that's something you want to ask customers about. And also, um, and this goes back to what I mentioned in the beginning, you want to think here about similar programs that you offer or that the city offers or that your organizations offer and how you might be able to link to this program. So this might be a good 
a place to see if you know residents are also interested in say if your city has a weatherization program or a roof repair program and this might be a good way to funnel customers into those programs if they make sense for them and then finally and we think this is really important uh, if you can ask residents for some optional demographic information so knowing the neighborhood income race familiarity with solar really tells your campaign how the outreach is working. And measuring this data is what's gonna help you improve. Uh, Solar United Neighbors is also working on introducing these questions in their campaign. So if you're working with Sun, uh, make sure you're talking to your program manager or coordinator uh, if, if you're interested in tracking this data and make sure that's in the sign up form. All right, so that's most of what I wanted to cover. We did a brief overview of the content that a Solarize campaign uh, website should include and the data that you wanna collect during your enrollment process. Now I'm gonna stop sharing and pass it to Ryan. And then after Ryan's done presenting, we'll have insights from a number of experts uh, who will also touch on a lot of the data collection and enrollment process that I, I just talked about. All right, thanks, Dushar. So I'm just gonna quickly speak on this last subsection here, which should only take about seven or eight minutes, and then we'll be able to jump right into q and I know there's already a couple of questions in the chat that we can, we can get to uh, in that discussion um, and any other questions that people have. So lastly, I'm gonna touch on the actual roles and responsibilities for the campaign website development and management, just to make sure that um, everything goes smoothly with the with the website. So determining these roles and responsibilities is, is important for kind of accountability and operating a website efficiently. And these are some of the primary responsibilities that there are that you'll want to have a, a, someone on your team responsible for. So the first is drafting the website content. So this is what most of our presentation is about today. And Tushar covered a lot of this, and this includes things like the overview of the campaign, the sign up form and events, uh, but making sure someone is responsible for actually drafting that content. And while we have a template that you'll, you'll be working with in your community breakouts at the second half of this uh, workshop, just making sure that someone's responsible for finalizing that. The second is the campaign logo. So this will be featured prominently on the webpage as well as likely all communications and outreach. So um, making sure that someone is, is set to design that logo. And a couple of things to keep in mind when thinking about that logo is, is trying to keep it unique to your community if you can, but still keeping it simple and clear and, and not getting too into the, uh, into the weeds of a complicated logo. And if possible, aligning the color and font with kind of the, the your specific communities or city governments uh, color and, and font. So here are a couple logo examples I just kind of found online to give you a sense of what options are out there and what people have done in the past. And when you look at those six options, um, kind of thinking to yourself, okay, what, what looks like the logo I would be most interested in, in clicking on or something that sparks interest as you develop your own logo. Um, and there's there, while there is uh, free software out there like 99designs or, or other free software, um, this is likely something that most um, organizations have a, a marketing or communications person that can help with actually developing that logo. The next is on designing the website. So once you have the content and, and the logo and everything together and the sign up form, you'll want to just work with your organization's web developer to organize that all onto a page. And using the examples that Tushar uh, spoke to, trying to think through what you actually want your website to look like. The next is on managing particip participant data. So these last two is more on the management of the website. So once people sign up, what type of management software are you using and how is that being, and how is, how is the communications to those participants being tracked? So is it just a simple, you know, Google form that leads to a backend file that you're just manually using and, and updating, or is it connected to some type of broader software like Salesforce or something like that? Um, and, and then how are you 
continuing to track that when the installer is communicating with them versus when you're communicating with those participants, just to make sure that every participant that signs up is, is communicated in a efficient way. And also on managing this data is, a, and Tushar had, had uh, noted this on low and moderate income verification. So there'll likely be a question on, you know, if you have an LMI type program offering that they think that they'll qualify, but who is actually responsible for verifying that? And what does that process look like given the, the low and moderate income levels in your community? Lastly is just updating the website throughout the campaign. So Tushar noted the kind of progress tracker. So making sure that it's updated with the, with the number of people that have signed up and, and signed a contract versus whatever goal that you have, making sure that the events are up to date and then lastly, with photos and testimonials, photos and, and testimonials are, are always a great way to attract people to a website and stay engaged on the website if they can see people are actually interacting and signing up for it, as well as any testimonials that can come along with it. So who is responsible for taking those photos at events and, and gathering those testimonials? So those are five main areas of roles and responsibilities. We'll have some time, we have some time set aside in the community breakouts to actually um, modify a previous worksheet that you all had worked on on roles and responsibilities for the campaign, just to make sure that someone on your team is responsible for all of this. And for those working with Solar United Neighbors or, or Solar Crowdsource or a similar organization, again, a lot of this will likely be done by that organization, but still something to make sure that everyone is on the same page about. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that we can enter into a little bit of Q&A and discussion with some, some of the experts that we have today. I'll pass it over to Tushar to facilitate that discussion. Great, thanks Ryan. Um, so yeah, now we're gonna go into kind of a panel discussion where we have experts from Philadelphia Energy Authority, Solar United Neighbors, and self. Um, and once I'm going to ask each of them a question, and then once we hear from them, we'll also have some time for participant questions. So feel free to start lining up questions in the chat box. So I wanted to start with Mavish. Mavish, are you ready? I'm ready. Awesome. So um, Mavish Ilias is, um, works at Philadelphia Energy Authority. Um, and she's Solarize Phillies. Um, she is a solar project coordinator for the program. Um, so Mavish, I wanted to ask you, and actually, um, Jasenia, I'll be asking you a very similar question. So just a heads up on that. But um, so Mavish, I wanted to ask you what kind of enrollment questions were important for LMI residents in the Solarize Philly process? And how did you follow up with residents and assess eligibility, solar readiness, uh, or just the need for more, more follow-up in solar education? That is a great question. And thank you so much for walking everyone through our Solarize Philly website. I think that was super helpful and it aligns perfectly with what I'm about to share. So as you saw that um, our website is very detailed. It has a lot of sections and a very specific section for the solar savings grant program, which is our offering um, to the LMI customers. But our intake form is very simple and concise. And this is because we recently did uh, an exercise with a consultant who advised us to simplify and shorten our intake form. So even though the website has a lot of detailed information, we want to make sure that the form is not lengthy and complicated because that can actually drive away the customers, especially since we're all in the middle of a global pandemic. And, you know, there are so many other things um, that are worrying people or people have to do with so many other things. So we did, did that exercise and that actually helped us a lot. And when we assessed the data, you know, we found out that the number of bounce backs from our website, uh, you know, that went down. So uh, the intake form, we basically ask for very basic contact information along with some other questions to make sure that the customers are eligible for the LMI offering. So we ask the customers to acknowledge that, you know, they qualify based on the total household income, which must be below 80% of the area median income. 
And as a part of the intake form, we also ask the customers to either upload a copy of their utility bill, their electric bill, or to sign a waiver which authorizes Philadelphia Energy Authority to reach out to the utility company and gather the electric usage and billing history um, you know, on behalf of the customer. Then after a customer has submitted the intake form, we personally make a phone call to the customer to welcome, to the, welcome them to the program. And this is also an opportunity for us to educate them about solar. So we have a very detailed conversation. Uh, we address any questions that the customers may have. We also give them a sense of what happens next and a sense of the timeline. And it is during this phone call that we asked more detailed questions like, um, how many people are currently living in your households? Has their income been recently impacted due to COVID-19? Do you, um, you know, expect your electric usage to go up in the future? And some other questions uh, related to solar readiness, for example, how old is your roof? Um, do you know of any existing roof issues, such as any cracks or any leaks? And then um, the sign-up form, basically, it is um, supported by FormStack and all the information flows into Salesforce. So we make sure that all the call notes are also entered in Salesforce and all the relevant information is transferred to the installer so that the proposal is customized accordingly. Now, after the phone call, we also make sure that we send a follow-up email just to re reiterate everything that was discussed on the phone call. And also, um, it is at that point that we ask for any follow-up documents, for example, income verification documents, or if there's anything else that we need. So we try to break everything into very simple steps for the customers. And making that phone call, it really helps us build trust and credibility, and also to address any questions that the customer may have. And so far, the strategy has worked great for us. You know, it has been very helpful. Um, and I think, um, especially because, you know, in Philadelphia and, you know, everything that's happening, it has really helped us overcome any challenges or any concerns that the customer may be facing. So, yeah, that's um, a very quick overview of our strategy. And I would be happy to answer if you have any follow-up questions. And I can leave everyone with my contact info as well. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for those insights, Mavish. And I think, we'll, yeah, we'll have questions after we hear from the rest of the panelists. Um, but I think there were a lot of key points that you mentioned that make a lot of sense. So thanks for that. Um, Jasenia, I kind of wanted to ask you a similar question. Uh, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. So, um, so yeah, Jasenia Rivera is Director of Equity and Inclusion at Solar United Neighbors. Basically wanted to ask you, uh, kind of the same question from your perspective, working with the solar for all process, what kind of enrollment questions were important for LMI residents? And then how did you follow up with residents to assess eligibility, solar readiness, um, or the need for more information? Uh, sure, it was almost a similar process as the one uh, my cohort from Philly just described, uh, except solar for all was a little longer. Uh, we asked for the basic contact information, but we also asked for date of birth, uh, income, not only for the uh, applicant, but any household members. We, had, we needed their name, date of birth, and income levels for everyone in the house, as well as uh, if they were homeowners or renters, because uh, the program applied to both. And uh, the most important question was whether or not they were already participating in a need-based assistance program, because that was one of the two ways that the district qualified folks for the Solar for All program. If they were already on a need-based program, they automatically qualified. If they were not, we walked them through filling uh, a LIHEAP application. So the, the district was just using the portal as a way to gather all the documents they needed to verify their income. Uh, it just so happens that if they also qualified for LIHEAP, they got both at the same time. They got Solar for All and LIHEAP as well, if they qualified for both of them. Uh, in terms of readiness and um, eligibility, what we did is we uh, we had them join the co-op as a, all the other members of market rate, whether they were paying for it or they were participating in Solar for All. So we had on our co-op side the uh, income ranges so they could see, hey, this is a low income program. If you fall within these income guidelines, just let us know mark the checkbox, we'll contact you uh, to verify all of that. So we also asked for how old the roof was, if there were any problems, and our uh, team will look uh, uh, 
their house and make sure that there was enough roof space, that it wasn't shaded or that it was in the right orientation. So we would have them pre-qualified. So the installer always had the last word on that, but uh, whenever they marked that they were interested in the solar for all program, they would get a call from us, from one of our team members, and we would walk them through the entire process what the program was, how to apply for it, how to verify their income, what they should be expecting, uh, when the installer was going to connect with them, if there was already an installer selected at that point, and if not, where we were at the stage of the co-op. We would follow that call with an email to the participants that had a letter that explained everything we just talked about in the application for the Solar for All program. If we were working with a participant that wasn't comfortable or did not have an email address, we would then send them a paper copy of both of those things. So we would send them by mail. And uh, we invited them to our info sessions. If they couldn't make it, uh, again, we had like a mini info session during the phone call explaining how solar work and what they could expect. Thank you. So it sounds like from both Bavish and Chisanya, it was a lot of a lot of back up, uh, back end work too after the, the sign up form. Um, so next, I wanted to to move to to Doug, um, who Doug Doug Cowards, the executive director at the Solar Energy Loan Fund. And Doug, I wanted to ask you, given your experience working with LMI customers itself, what what questions would you ask um, interested LMI participants to assess? specifically their solar readiness? And then how would you follow up to ensure that they have the necessary information and you know, financial assistance to make a decision that's in their best interest? Wow, all in a couple of minutes. Um, thank you to Shar and thanks for RMI for the invite to be here today. Um, I think uh, some of the first questions that come to my mind when we have a uh, local resident interested in, in working either with a co-op or just coming in and, and seeking financing or a solar project, the very first question I'm gonna ask them is, have they already taken uh, steps you know, with energy conservation and efficiencies to try and reduce their energy use? Because those are obviously the most cost-effective first steps and many homeowners are excited about solar and wanna do that. And we try and help homeowners go, go through those stages and we see solar as the last step, not the first step. So providing guidance to them about you know, taking advantage of those more cost-effective steps is a very first question. Um, obviously the roof and the condition of the roof is, is a, a critical second question. You're putting on a system that's got a warranty life of 20 to 25 years if your roof's falling apart. And obviously in LMI neighborhoods, the housing stock is typically older and needs more basic repairs. So you need to assess those conditions. Um, another one that generally is important in Florida anyway is does your utility even offer net metering? Because if they don't offer a retail credit on your investment, that utility is going to profit off your investment instead of you. Uh, so I'd be checking into the net metering rules before I made a twenty or thirty thousand dollar investment. Um, and then I'd also a lot of people think that the twenty six percent federal tax credit is a given, and that's not necessarily the case. And so you really need to check with your tax advisor and make sure that you truly can capture that. You know, I mean, it's a quarter of the cost, so it's it's a huge piece. Um, and then a little more specifically about screening. Um, is to make sure that uh, they're getting multiple quotes. Uh, did someone just show up at their door and offer a price to them? Uh, or have they gotten you know, several contractors to come in and, and offer you know, competitive pricing? Um, we've seen some of our clients come in and they were offered twice the market rate and they were ready to proceed because they didn't know otherwise. So um, I, I think getting several quotes is, is critical. And then another one quickly is uh, the contractor themselves. Are they reputable? Do they have proper license? Uh, insurance, a good track record. Is it a company that, that you want to work with? That's another critical issue. The products, the type of PV products that they're using, have they been properly vetted by a third party entity like here in Florida, the Florida Solar Energy Center, but making sure you're investing in quality products um, as well. Um, but, and then on the financing side, you know, this is particularly for, for the solarized campaigns, what I've seen and I have nothing but applause for Florida Sun and the great work they're doing, but many times a contractor is selected and then that contractor brings their financing to the table. Um, that means that they're likely to have a uh, credit score based 
formula uh, for approval. So if you don't have a 680 or 700 credit score, you're not eligible, therefore you can't take advantage of the program. So if you're gonna try and promote solar and do it comprehensively uh, and fairly and bring in LMI homeowners, you need to make sure that you also have inclusive financing options like the Solar and Energy Loan Fund and others so that working class families and retirees on fixed incomes who may not have perfect credit can still qualify. So those are just a couple of uh, you know, key issues that I think you should look at as you're promoting solar. Uh, bottom line, you don't wanna push solar on people unless they have the ability to pay, particularly when you're talking about financing programs like PACE, which is an equity-based model that uh, is a tax lien on the property that you pay as a part of your property taxes. If you default on those, you can lose your house. So it's a pretty serious situation and need to make sure that people are reducing that risk and getting a lending product that they can afford. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, I think that um, you spoke to a lot of points that I think we were trying to emphasize in our last session, uh, our last workshop on the RFP and like really focusing on, you know, consumer protection and picking a quality installer and whatnot are definitely important. But I think I definitely appreciate the, the points that you brought up about, you know, checking for whether the home's weatherized and their roof's ready and whether they're yeah, making sure that they are not being pushed to pay for something that they can't afford. Um, so I wanted to pivot a little bit and go to Corey, if you're ready. Great. Um, yeah, so Corey, um, so Corey Ramson is VP of Gold Solar Programs at Solar United Neighbors. Corey, I wanted to ask you what recommendations do you have for backend data management after a customer's sign up? So feel free to touch on you know, how to use the data effectively, how to share and collaborate with the installer, maintaining privacy, um, and how you manage follow ups. Sounds good. Everyone's favorite topic back end data management, right? <laughs> uh, so I think, I mean, this is a pretty broad topic, right? But I think the most important thing as far as um, getting from signing people up to the point where you're actually tracking them is, is, is getting a sense of what um, resources you have available in your organization or in partner organizations, because you're really choosing uh, between sort of standing something up temporarily or you know just for this purpose, whether it's simple as a form, a Google form um, and, a, and a spreadsheet, or whether you're using an existing CRM you know, uh, system like Salesforce or something else. Obviously the CRM system is gonna provide better functionality and sort of long-term maintenance of that data. So that's that's certainly the preference, but um, I think you wanna evaluate that quickly and just sort of make a decision and, and move forward. You can always move data from you know, one place to another. Um, I do recommend you pay in particular attention, especially if you have lots of partners that are working in this data and also obviously with the installers who are gonna be interacting with it, is just paying close attention to what you're comfortable with people seeing. Uh, it may be a subset of that data that a total data you're collecting as well as who can edit that information. So if you're using, particularly with something like uh, Google Sheets or something that's like a shared spreadsheet, which is super easy to stand up, but also really easy to edit and you know, override information by accident. So there's just some things like that you just wanna make sure you're, you're paying attention to upfront. Um, and in some cases it may make sense for you to sort of move data temporarily to another location in another sheet to give the access to an installer, for example. Um, but uh, just thinking through that at the beginning is important. Um, on the sort of the customer side uh, of that, when you're bringing people into the system, you also wanna think about the points where you wanna communicate with them based on that data. So obviously acknowledging when they some, uh, join the group, but um, when else are you gonna talk to them? Are you gonna talk to them when you've selected an installer or that installer's you know, been selected? Are you going to talk to about talk to them when you've heard they've gotten a proposal or when their project's complete? So just be aware of the different touch points of communication you want, whether it's email or phone call or what have you, to keep people engaged and keep them updated and, and what's going on with the system. I mean, with the with the program. Um, in terms of <clears throat> excuse me, data accuracy, you want to account for the fact that you may have to update or verify information directly with the homeowner. So if they're applying and there's some issues with trees, for example, you wanna uh, make sure that you can interact with them and ask follow-up questions, especially if uh, you're seeing lots of tree canopy and someone saying that you know, their house roof is a good fit for solar, you just wanna identify that clearly and, and be able to note that, not only for your purposes, but also to communicate to, that to the installer. Um, we talked a little bit about privacy already. 
but just I can't sort of stress that part enough. You're especially for programs that have income qualification, just be super clear about who gets to see what data uh, there. And you can really um, create some problems if you're if you're not thinking about those issues up front. Um, and then the second the last part here, I think, or is sort of a two part uh, of this uh, process of using this data, which is around uh, coordination. So not only with the partners, so what information do you want to report out to your partners and to people supporting this effort, but how frequently? So one thing we do at Solar United Neighbors is we'll send out uh, partner reports periodically, usually once a week, uh, sometimes once every other week later on to say how many people are in the group, um, what's happening with their status of their projects when we get to that stage. It's a great way to keep your partners engaged, see the growth of the group, and also to encourage people to continue to, to bring people to the group uh, as long as the sign-up period is open. So that sort of regular reporting is really useful. It could be something that's email based. It could be just you know creating a dashboard that they can reference depending on the systems that you have available. And then on the installer side, making it easy for them to interact with your data. They're all going to have their own systems to track their customers. So they may be able to interface with your system, but I think you want to assume in most cases that whatever system you've set up, they're probably going to be coming to you and providing some number of updates um, for us. We track when someone gets a proposal, uh, sorry, when someone has a site visit scheduled, when they've gotten a proposal, when their projects complete, uh, as well as some key milestone dates, like the installation date, when the system is uh, fully interconnected, things like that. That helps us stay on top of the projects. It also helps us have better conversations with the installers about what's happening and ultimately helps us support the people in the group uh, more effectively. But you want to make sure that the installers can access that information and provide those updates to you or whoever's managing that relationship. So those are things to sort of think about ahead of time um, with the use of the data. But uh, I would say even all of this is maybe things you haven't worked on before. The most important thing, I think, is just to you know pick a lane and just go with it. Um, you can always adjust later. You don't necessarily want to create a perfect system because um, that doesn't exist. You just want to sort of take the opportunity to uh, think about the information you want and then you know, pick a lane, like I said, and just and just start working with it. And uh, and you can always adjust later if you need to. It's, if this is your first Solarize program, for cities that use our services or you know some of the other providers here, we're going to take care of all of that for you. But uh, we still want to hear feedback about. What information we're tracking and what information you know you'd like to see during that process. Uh, there's always always places we can learn and and um, improve about the way we we manage our data for in service to these co-ops and these pro solar, solarized programs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Awesome. Thanks. Lots of lots of good points there. Uh, thanks, Corey, and thanks to all of our experts. Um, so, because we've definitely got some questions in the chat and. We went a little longer, but I think we can go until 10 past um, before we take a break. Um, so if folks have questions, feel free to put them in a chat or unmute yourself. But I do want to maybe um, combine a couple of questions in the chat to start, and then maybe um, any of our panelists can take this. But so it looks like we have a question on uh, Brenda asked that, you know, we've had some predatory suppliers, so residents. Um, are or should be uncomfortable with sharing their bills. So how do you make them comfortable with uploading it? And then we had a kind of similar question from Carrie or related question that, you know, bills vary by season, especially um, in places with hot, with hot summers um, or cold winters. So does it make sense to request people to upload a single bill or, or do they upload annual bills? And how do you get around that? And I saw Mavish had a kind of work around that PEA uses. So if anyone wants to respond to that. Um, what we did in DC was actually build that trust with the clients. Uh, they we'd ask for the bill when they sign up for the co-op, but it's not mandatory. So once we build that trust, we walk them through the program, we let them know that the installer is going to need to see that bill because they can't design the system without that bill. So uh, once they met with the installer, they hand them the bill or they uploaded whichever one they're comfortable with. And I was gonna add that for here, at least most bills have that 12 month of usage. So it shows you the past 12 months of usage. So it's uh, easy to see the difference and the overall energy use. So you can design a system based on that. 
Cool. Yeah. I think actually a few of us, I think I remember I looked at my bill just before this workshop and realized it's only a month. So um, that was a question that we had come up with too. But the, yeah, the same from Posigen as well. Like we, um, we estimate around a 12 month, 12 month consumption inquiry. Um, so, and, and on our, I was in Louisiana, Connecticut, and uh, New Jersey, they show a, a 12 month consumption. So. Yeah, I'd just like to add real quick that um, the electric bills that we get here through Pico, they, they have a graph that show 12 month of usage. Um, which we usually typically use for our market rate customers. But for the LMI customers, we also look at the activity statement, which is a statement that we get from our utility company. And it gives you a breakdown of month to month usage, which is like more detailed information. And we use that information to basically size the system and also to calculate how much the customer will be saving on the utility bill. Um, thanks, yeah. Thanks, Justinia and Ruda and Mavish. Um, so I'm looking through the chat and I feel like we've kind of answered a lot of questions either verbally or in the chat. Um, does anyone have a question that they feel has not been answered um, that kind of relates to what we've been presenting today or? Um, I've got a little bit of a concern uh, to kind of bring up around qualifying of customers, um, but I, like I fully admit that that Posigen's offering may be a little bit unique in the um, in the solar in the solar industry as our qualifications for uh, for a potential customer. And please forgive me, guys, if you hear um, some eighth grade English. I, like I hope that you'll you'll at least have some refreshing. My girlfriend is a is a teacher. Um, but we, we, we can all learn something. Um, but at any rate, Posigen's, Posigen's offering um, for LMI is, is targeted to LMI, but we don't have any credit score requirement for qualification. So with, 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 our, unique, with our unique offering, um, your house needs to be solar ready, solar available, um, and you have to have a, a high enough bill to qualify for for our leasing program, um, but it's not a, um, it's like the customer themselves doesn't go into debt uh, making use of the system or benefiting from the solar that, that they produce on their homes. But again, that, like we've got a, a, a bit of a unique offering, so it, it may not be the most ubiquitous. Thanks, Ruda. Um, so yeah, I had a question about the tax credit because um, Doug had brought up the, that in his talk. He said, you know, that um, that the tax credit isn't necessarily guaranteed. So I was wondering, is that because if you if you have a low enough income, you don't pay that much tax anyway, so you can't take advantage of the credit? I mean, what is the it, that's what popped into my head as, as, a, as a potential issue with the tax credit? Yeah, so actually, um, so Karen, thanks for that question. And Susanna um, also had a question about how renters can participate. Um, I feel like those are maybe like larger questions that um, might make sense uh, for us to follow up with you specifically, and maybe not like specifically related to, to the website. Um, so if we could just follow up with you on those questions, I, I can do that. And but just wanted to maybe check and see if anyone had a more a question more focused on like the website and data collection for now uh, or if not we could we could start to start the break you're like sure Christopher, I can see your hand yeah i was just going to ask about um this is something i need to look into more but i just think we may have historical districts where there may be some issues with permitting um but i'm just wondering what does anybody use websites that try to be really sophisticated and try to screen people out based on their address or, or do you do that more of as a back-end activity after they sign up? I, could, I can cover it for us. We, we don't try to do anything fancy as far as address lookup, but we do ask people both, um, I should have actually brought that, we ask people if they're in a historic district. We also ask them if they're um, part of an HOA, both of which can be complicating factors. So it's helpful information for us so we can educate them and also for the installer. Yeah, and very quickly, at BEA, we have a map 
um, and we can enter the address and it shows if a property is located in a historic district. And accordingly, the installers can file for the paperwork accordingly. All right, um, so thanks everyone. I think it's probably a good time to, to take a break, um, but definitely appreciated the conversation and Karen and Susanna, I will, um, Ryan and I will work on getting back to you specifically on your questions. Um, but yeah, just wanna thank all of our experts for being on. Similar to what we did last time, we're going to be doing a rapid report out of a couple different questions. And my screen is not going forward. There we go. Um, so the first question that we have is, which website content do you still need help developing? And what we're gonna do here is um, have everyone use the Zoom annotate feature to select a stamp to put on any of the applicable categories here. So if you go to the top of your screen and you click on, I believe it's view options and click annotate, there should be an option towards the left of that bar at the top of your screen to hit the stamp option. So feel free to put a, a check mark or a star or a heart uh, in any of those categories on content you still need help developing. Looks like so far the low and moderate income program details is winning the day. And I'll give a little bit more time, maybe 10 more seconds for people to add their other thoughts. Couple, um, couple other people were still need some help developing the solar economics overview as well as the campaign logo. Uh, but it looks like one group is, is totally set, so that's great to see. All right, and then our next question is, what aspects of the sign-up form did you focus on during your discussion? So LMI-related questions, whether to include race-related questions, solar readiness, the installer selection criteria, effectiveness of the communication, so how they heard about the campaign, or other. All right, so it looks like a pretty good spread on the sign up form, but most people focus on the LMI related questions as well as solar readiness. And the last rapid report out question I have is Were you successful in identifying? team members for each of the campaign website roles and responsibilities. Going back to that original work you had. And it looks like most people got most of the roles and responsibilities finished up uh, with a few others getting all of them finalized. All right, and then the last question I have is what you'll actually type in, type your answer into the chat. So what is the biggest remaining barrier you face to developing and managing the website? And again, please put your answer to that in the chat. That's a question I cannot actually see the chat right now, so I'll just assume that there are some really good questions or really good barriers that are being put in there right now. Um, and then we'll give maybe another, another 10 seconds for people to write their remaining barrier that they would like to face. And this will be helpful for our team as we think through how we can continue to help each campaign prepare for that, prepare for their campaign and their website. Might be helpful to have a little more time because I think still a lot of answers coming in. Okay, sounds good. Oh, and I just, my screen just allowed me to see the chat. So now I can, I can see the questions coming. So it looks like um, some barriers around choosing um, the technologies, who's gonna manage the website, just staffing the, the issue 
uh, the issue of staffing, who's going to host the website, setting up the site, integrating programs based on qualifications, managing the site, data collection, using a previous campaign website. So a lot of kind of variety there, but a lot of topics that I think we, we covered as well. Okay, so then that sounds good. The last thing I have to do here is hope that Zoom allows me to clear this which it is not. Let's see here. All right, there we go. Thank you to whoever just helped clear that for me. Um, so our, our last slide here is on next steps. So um, from the content today, we really want you all to just develop your campaign website. Even if you won't be launching for two months, um, the homework from this workshop is really to get that campaign website up. And even if it's not going to be promoted, at least having it in place. So work with your web developer to translate the content from the, your worksheet you worked on today into an actual web page or website. We'd also appreciate um, the leaders of each team to continue to update our campaign progress tracker. So in our check-in calls, um, we updated that with you all and I'll include the link to that in my follow-up email, but we'd appreciate everyone just continuing to update your progress. So we can see how everyone is doing along the way. And just a reminder, the next workshop is going to be on communications and outreach. So one of the most important workshops in this cohort process, that's gonna be on February 10th at this time. Um, so please RSVP to that, as well as invite your organization's communications staff to that, since that will be a, an important uh, workshop to bring those staff into. Uh, but that is about it for me. So we will end at three minutes early today. And if anyone has any additional questions, we'll stay on um, after this. But for now, thank you all. And we'll talk to you soon.